Hey again everybody! July 2021 has come to a close, and as always we've been pushing forward, making good progress on our story-driven RPG. I hope you're all doing well and are ready to see what we've been up to this month. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone as always that Exodus Rising is still very much a work in progress. Everything that we showcase in these devlogs is not final and is subject to change leading up to release. Since we showed off the lower city at the beginning of the month, we've made a lot of progress adding in art to this area. As was also the case with the Colosseum, it's been really cool seeing this area develop over the course of June and July. We won't be showing you all of the art that has been added to this dungeon, because as we mentioned in our last devlog, we want you to have fun exploring these locations for yourselves. Our goal moving forward is to show you all a small glimpse of some of our upcoming levels. Without spoiling you, we want to give you an idea as to the overall look and feel that you can expect with these unique locations that you'll be visiting. Before moving on, I want to mention that this month we updated our landscape material to allow for the use of tessellation. This allows us to make the ground that you walk on look more 3D and realistic. I wanted to mention this because not only is it just a cool feature by itself, but it also ties into the next part of this devlog. A big thing that we've introduced into the world of Leda this month is a dynamic weather system, which gives us control over everything from thunderstorms to blizzards. We're excited that we can now expand on our goal of having each location in the world be a unique experience, by also having the atmosphere of each area differ dependent on the weather conditions. As the weather conditions shift dynamically, it means that each of you are going to have different experiences when travelling to new areas. For example, one of you may enter the lower city at the crack of dawn, with not a cloud in the sky. Others will arrive at night surrounded by fog or in the middle of a torrential downpour. Whilst the weather conditions will differ from player to player throughout the majority of the city, we also have the ability to set each location to use a certain weather type if we want to. We're really excited to put this to use for different areas where we want to push a specific atmosphere. A haunted manor trapped in the middle of a thunderstorm, for example. The implementation of this dynamic weather system has proved to be a fantastic addition to the world, but for it to work well within the world, it was most certainly not as simple as just adding it in. I'd like to cover some of the small details regarding this system that have kept us busy throughout July, which we've been working on to really bring the world to life and immerse you in this high fantasy setting. Each material in the world now has a few different variants, which allow us to make buildings, rocks, trees, etc. look wet whilst it's raining. This also applies to the various creatures and beasts you'll encounter throughout the world, as well as the armour of NPCs, and of course your own armour too. We've been adding in additional VFX for when it's raining, so that rain pours off of roofs, tents and other surfaces. The rain will also slide down glass windows and create ripples when it hits the water throughout the world. Something that is most noticeable during heavy rain and thunder, but applies no matter the weather, is how the sounds of the outside world are muffled when you enter an interior. I want to go back to the landscape tessellation that I mentioned previously, as the new weather system benefits greatly from it. During heavy rainfall, puddles will form throughout the world, and the tessellation allows them to form at varying heights. It also allows for snow to collect in the gaps of the bricks in the street. Additionally, by placing interactors on the individual feet and torso of the player, we're able to use the tessellation to allow you to form a path in the snow as you wander around. This also applies to the various NPCs and enemies that you'll encounter on your adventure. Over time, as the world continues to be coated in white, the paths that were created are slowly filled in with a new layer of snow. With that being said, those are the main things that I wanted to cover regarding our new weather system. As I mentioned before, working this new system into the game has taken a lot of time this month, as we want to make sure that we get it right and create an exciting and immersive world for you all to explore. Moving on then, let's talk about some of the other changes we've made throughout July. As the lower city set dressing continues, various new levels are being designed alongside it. Once again, we'll be keeping info about these levels to a bare minimum, but we'll still be sure to keep you up to date on how we're progressing with them each month. You now leave ripples in the water as you step through puddles, which also has new sound effects. Additionally, after stepping in water, you'll now leave wet footprints, which slowly dry up the more you walk around as your boots begin to dry. 
Clarabac's lock-on reticle was bugged previously, as it was visible on them when they burrowed underground. This has since been fixed, meaning you'll now have no idea where they're going to pop up and will need to stay vigilant to avoid being caught off guard. Lanterns throughout the world now turn on as the sun begins to set over Varen. They'll also turn on during heavy rain and snowfall to illuminate the path. Pressing the attack button whilst your weapon is sheathed will now perform a quick attack. You can also go straight into a block with a sheathed weapon. Before, you had to press a separate button to bring out your weapon first, before being able to attack or block. Previously, you rolled in the direction your character was facing, meaning you had to turn and face the direction you wanted to dodge. With a recent change, the dodge now forces you in the direction you're pressing instead. It's hard to show you the change with this, because it's very much an improvement with how the game controls, but this tiny adjustment makes dodging instantaneous and much more responsive. With the still recent engine update, we're now able to take advantage of Unreal Engine's volumetric clouds. And finally, we've adjusted the camera for when you enter the interiors of buildings and other tight spaces. Before, the camera would stay at the same position regardless of where you were, making it hard to navigate indoor areas due to the camera clipping through the walls. The camera now zooms in and moves slightly to the side of the player, which makes indoor areas much easier to traverse. Additionally, you may notice throughout this devlog that Exodus Rising seems significantly brighter than usual. The lighting throughout the world isn't currently reminiscent of the final game, due to engine updates at the beginning of the month breaking a few things. We'll be sure to fix this in the future and bring back the correct lighting. To start off this month's devlog, I'd like to cover one of the most requested things so far, and talk about our world and game progression. Thankfully there's a lot of work going on in this area currently, and so there's tons for us to talk about. When we first set out to develop Exodus Rising, we knew that we wanted to build the foundations of a huge fantasy RPG world, one full of races, factions, skills, spells, enemies, creatures, and continent-spanning conflicts. We also knew that we wanted to take you, the player, along for the ride, as we developed this with each new title in the franchise until we could grow the team large enough to achieve such things. Having these grand ambitions, and knowing what's achievable and what isn't, particularly with a small team of which some members have come and gone, has proven particularly difficult since development began. It has required at points rather large adjustments, and accepting that something rather substantial just isn't working. Thankfully, because we're a small indie team, we're not at the whim of quite so strict deadlines, and whilst big changes and reworks are incredibly risky for us, it does ultimately mean the decision is ours to make. For example, did you know we're currently on the fourth version of the story and world for Exodus Rising? Each about 50,000 words or more in length, and requiring months of level reworking. Originally, we designed Exodus Rising to be mostly open world, and had you accompanying a small group of NPCs as they delved the abandoned city of our inn. This felt too empty, and so we expanded the world to include smaller factions and humans, such as bandits and treasure hunters, to thrash the world out. But this required us to chop the city up into smaller segments for optimization and story progression to work efficiently. We reworked this into a multiple choice structure that allowed you to engage or not engage with the bigger narrative as you saw fit similarly to a choose-your-own-adventure style structure. This version was incredibly fun to design, but ultimately resulted in many weaker pathways. Due to needing a set ending that fed into the wider narrative we wanted to tell, it unfortunately didn't deliver what we'd hoped. Our current and final version of the world was the biggest rework of all. At the end of 2020, we went back to the drawing board. We wiped it clean and used all of the best parts from the lore, the world, the mechanics, and rebuilt them into something completely new and the Forsaken Realms were born. This is the version you see developing before you, and we now truly believe we found the right balance between everything we set out to achieve. In our April devlog, we talked about the level flow of Exodus Rising, which we have since changed to better match the semi-open world experience we now want to deliver. So what does this look like? Well, when you get your hands on Exodus Rising, you'll experience both semi-open world areas, full of enemies, quests, puzzles, loot and NPCs, as well as more structured dungeon style areas that carry the story forward and allow us to get creative with how these key locations look and feel, much more so than if we remain completely open world. Think of it this way, as you first arrive in Varin, you'll have complete access to the area surrounding the city to explore as you like. You can improve your character, interact with the side quests, meet the inhabitants, whatever you so choose. 
but if you want to get inside the city you'll need to earn your way inside. And to do that you'll need to prove yourself by completing the story content required and overcome the boss linked to said story content. The Colosseum is the first new area that we've been designing with this structure in mind. In our last devlog at the end of May we had the basic layout for this area complete. Throughout June we made a good start set dressing and lighting the Colosseum, and so you'll now have a much better understanding of the overall look and feel that we're going for with this location. By reworking levels such as the arena into unique dungeons, we're really able to hone in on making them feel special. We can tailor the lighting and visual effects in every area in Exodus Rising for a fresh and exciting experience with every new place you visit. With more freedom over the flow of each level, we can add a greater sense of exploration as you traverse the world. The Colosseum has already come a long way since we first began work on it, and we're really excited to see how it comes together in the near future. A new area we've been designing this month is the Lower City. Much like the Colosseum, the Lower City is a revamp of another location, the Varan Main Street, which we felt wasn't living up to standards. You'll recognise this area from some of our older devlogs. Before we continue, we're going to be talking about this level in a little more depth, and so I just wanted to give a little spoiler warning. We're only going to be doing this for this one dungeon to show you all in detail why we're making the changes we are, so that we can really push these new locations we're designing in the world. We won't be doing this level of detail for future dungeons, so that we don't ruin the game for all of you following along with us. But we've been getting lots of questions, and as always we want to be as transparent as possible with our development. As the Lower City is very much in its early stages, I'd like to give you all a rundown on what it is that we're looking to achieve with this location moving forward. As you set foot in the city, you'll immediately be able to see the path leading to the exit of the area. In contrast to the old Main Street, which is just a straight line, we wanted to show you the end goal you're working towards right from the beginning. The Lower City is structured so that you'll traverse the area in a big curve, navigating through different buildings, alleys and more, and eventually ending up back near the start of the level. We want to add as much variety to the gameplay of the Lower City as possible, so that you have fun traversing and exploring the level from top to bottom. We've been doing this by carefully plotting out each area of the level, so that no section feels the same as another. Using this small area of the level as an example, as you enter this alley you'll be funneled into some bandits, which results in close quarter combat. You'll navigate through these alleys until you enter a more open area, where you'll fight a larger group of bandits, this time with more space to move around and plan your attacks. Not only will you have a variety of different encounters and challenges to overcome, but you'll also have secrets, puzzles and loot to find throughout the levels off the beaten track. To summarise our objective for the Lower City, we want to ensure that you experience a range of gameplay throughout the level, and don't feel bored doing the same thing over and over. Moving on now, I'd like to talk about some of the AI improvements that we've been working on this month. Our AI focus throughout June has been the Bandit Archers, as well as the Aurochs both of which have seen significant change. As you progress through Exodus Rising, archers will now become more and more challenging to fight, with their accuracy improving with each level. We've done this to keep you on your toes as you level up, and ensure that archer combat stays engaging throughout the entire game. Another change we made to the archers is making sure that their first shot always misses you. The reason for this change is because we felt that it was extremely annoying getting hit by a stray arrow from an enemy that you didn't know had spotted you. By having the first shot always miss, it gives you a chance to spot the archer and prepare a counter-attack. Additionally, archers will now have a harder time hitting their targets at a distance. Aside being more realistic, this offers more strategical approaches on how you can deal with this enemy in a combat situation. We're really happy with the improvements that we've made to the archers so far, but of course they're not yet complete. They'll require a lot more refinement and polish later down the line for them to really work with the gameplay we're going for but the basis for the kind of enemy we want them to be, and how we want them to perform, is now in place. The Orox is a beast that has been in Exodus Rising for a long time now, with some of the oldest footage of it in our alpha trailer. Much like the bandit archers and the sword and shield fighters from our last devlog, the AI for the Orox has been very basic up until now, just so that we could get it into the game where we needed it to be. The Orox is very much a passive beast that won't lay a finger on you, at least until it's provoked. As we set out to refine its AI, we took a step back to think about what our end goal for it is. As an optional enemy that you can choose whether to fight or not, we want it to be quite the challenging beast to defeat. With this in mind, the Aurochs has received a significant speed increase, meaning you'll have to stay on your toes as it comes charging towards you. 
Additionally, a problem with the old Orox was that it would try to headbutt you once it got in range of you, but this was extremely easy to avoid. The new Orox will perform a charge attack and won't stop unless it's A gone past you or B gone through you. This means that when you're in combat with the Orox, you best be prepared to dodge out of the way. The final adjustment that we've made to the Orox for the time being is adding a window for you to attack it. Previously, it would constantly charge around, leaving you no chance to land a hit on it, unless equipped with a bow or ranged magic spell. Whilst we want this beast to provide a huge challenge, we also want to ensure that any playstyle can be used to bring it down. After finishing its charge, it will now skid to slow itself down, and then proceed to shake its head for a short period of time. This is your chance to attack it. Again, this AI is still a work in progress, and we'll see further refinement in the future, but we're really happy with the improvements that we've made so far, and would love to know what all of your thoughts are on it. Staying on the topic of AI, our programmer has been busy this month working on NPC tethering. This allows us to set NPCs to return back to their spawn point if you exit a certain radius. Here you can see the crat chasing and attacking me inside the green sphere, but when I leave they lose interest and return back to their spawn. This is important because it prevents enemies from chasing you relentlessly around the entire map, resulting in you having to fight multiple enemy encounters at once. Additionally, a separate radius, in this example the red sphere, controls if NPCs are spawned in. With the ability to prevent enemy encounters from overlapping or stretching out longer than intended, we have more control over how each section of a level plays in Exodus Rising. We're already putting NPC tethering to good use in the lower city, as it's helping us to deliver the varied gameplay that we're going for. Before I end off this devlog, there are a few more things that I want to list off which have kept us busy this month. Behind the scenes, a lot of time has gone into writing the story and dialogue for Exodus Rising, and as a story-driven RPG, there is a huge amount that goes into creating an engaging narrative. It's something that we unfortunately can't show you all too much of, at the risk of spoiling the story. Nevertheless, we thought it was most certainly worth mentioning, as it has kept us extremely busy for several months, and has represented a good portion of development. Another thing that we've been busy working on, which we unfortunately can't show you guys, are some new bosses. This is something that I really can't talk about more, but know that you'll encounter various challenging enemies throughout your adventure. We're now utilising virtual texturing in our landscape to allow for seamless blends between assets and different surfaces. You can see how these rocks now become wet when placed in water. Here you can also see how the bottom half of these boulders blend with the grass and the mud. It's easier to see the difference when toggling the virtual texturing on and off. Finally, to end off, a small update that was suggested by some of you in the community. We removed the reticle that sat at the centre of the screen for melee weapons. This piece of UI didn't help you in any way during gameplay, and only really served as an annoying distraction. Melee combat feels much better with it removed. This change was suggested by some of the members in our Discord, and that's the best place for you to be if you would like to give us some feedback. Whilst we can't incorporate every suggestion into the game, we try to take all the feedback to heart, and at the very least listen to your idea and consider it moving forward. With that being said, that's everything I have to share for this month's devlog. As always, we'd love to know what you thought of everything we covered today, especially the world and game progression section at the beginning. We don't usually do deep dives like that, so we're really interested in hearing if you want to see more of those in the future. 